fellow Falcoholics, what is up? Welcome to the inaugural edition of the newly named Dirty Birds and Brews podcast. I am your host, Kevin Knight, at Falcoholic Kevin. The at has not changed. Uh, but uh, yes, the podcast is now officially owned and operated by myself, uh, so I'm excited about that. Uh, but otherwise, nothing else is going to change. You will continue to get all of your podcast episodes on the same feed. They will still be available on thefalcoholic.com, and the videos, of course, will still be on the Falcoholic YouTube page. There will be no changes to the Falcoholic Live as well. Uh, so just a, uh, I don't know the, the right word, the, the legal word, but, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a necessary required change, uh, contractually speaking, but otherwise the podcast will not change. We'll still have lots of great guests for you, hopefully lots of great uh, players coming on over the offseason as well. Uh, so nothing else is going to change. We may have some new advertisers, some new things of that nature uh, eventually. And on that note, if you're interested in advertising on the podcast, it is officially open. Uh, you can contact me at falcoholiclive at gmail.com. Uh, if you're interested in advertising on here, we'd love to, to provide an opportunity for local Atlanta businesses, uh, breweries, craft breweries, other breweries, uh, like to emphasize the brews part a little bit. Uh, definitely would be open to having segments on any brews that get sent my way uh, or otherwise, of course. Uh, so yeah, let me know if you're interested in pursuing that. But otherwise, we have a jam-packed episode for everyone here today on the Dirty Birds and Brews podcast. Uh, Going to be breaking down my next Falcons mock draft, taking a look at the post-free agency uh edition of this mock draft, sort of how things have changed with the Falcons free agent signings. They've signed several more players since our last Falcoholic Live episode uh, on Wednesday. We will be getting to those signings uh, on Falcoholic Live if you haven't already seen that episode. So definitely check that out Wednesday night's episode, sort of breaking that down and giving our overall thoughts on the early part of free agency. Um, but we're going to, you know, act as if free agency is, is mostly, you know, behind us. The Falcons still have plenty of money. Uh, some places they have as much as $25 million, perhaps a little bit less now with some of these recent signings. Um, but they've still got a lot of money to play around with. I suspect that we will see more additions either before or after the draft. But until then, uh, this is all we have to go on. The Falcons have 70 players under contract, which means they only have 20 open spots total. That And that doesn't include the seven draft picks that they currently have and they generally like to bring in a lot of undrafted free agents which which you I would expect you know at least eight to ten minimum of those guys coming in so that really only leaves you know another three to four veteran spots up for grabs um there are definitely some places that they could add veterans left guard swing tackle um you know linebacker edge there's definitely some places and I'll, I'll be getting into that more on uh, Monday's episode of the podcast, but let's take a look at how things have changed in terms of the uh, the draft with some of the moves that the Falcons have made. The biggest, most impactful one, probably the re-signing of Caleb McGarry. Before he was brought back, I was sort of of the mind that the Falcons would be likely to target an offensive tackle at eight if they didn't bring back McGarry because that's a big hole on the offensive line uh, that wasn't there before. But the Falcons did re-sign Caleb McGarry for a pretty reasonable contract, in my opinion, uh, getting him for just $11.5 million a year. Um, so that spot is no longer as big of an issue. I still do think that the Falcons are likely to target an offensive tackle at some point, but um, that takes that emphasis on getting that tackle settled and pushes it down the board a little bit. Um, I don't think it removes offensive line like from the equation entirely, but it, it's not as big of a deal as it used to be. Falcons have also signed Mike Hughes at corner to potentially be the slot uh, specialist based on what he was saying the other day. Uh, they signed a receiver, Mac Hollins, to sort of uh, build out that group a little bit. But again, there's still room for improvement there. Obviously, we have Jesse Bates in here to solidify that safety room in a major way. And... Uh, David Onyemata, defensive tackle. They brought back Lorenzo Carter, and they have a number of young players at edge. So really, the Falcons have sort of set themselves up with free agency to have a lot of flexibility to go after the best player available, which they've said they were going to do. And once again, they have done. And I think it'll be even more emphasized by the time we get to the draft with the players uh, that they, they continue to bring in. So without further ado, let's get started on this post-free agency mock draft. 
Um, so for the first pick, pick number eight, we're going to go with a defensive player here. Uh, it's going to be cornerback Devon Witherspoon from Illinois. Uh, I've already gone for Christian Gonzalez and honestly do think that the most likely player to end up a Falcon at this point at pick eight is Oregon quarterback Christian Gonzalez. But um, there is a chance he could be taken by the Lions. There's a chance he could be taken by the Raiders, who are sort of a wild card. Um, so it's not a guarantee that he falls to eight. And if he doesn't, I do think that Devon Witherspoon is one of the guys they will strongly consider. Um uh, and he's a little bit of a different player than Gonzalez, who I broke down on a previous mock. So let's get into Witherspoon a bit here. You know, fr- from the top, uh, the Falcons still need a, a, a corner, I think. Um, they haven't moved on from Casey Hayward, so they do have that veteran insurance there. But Hayward's going to be turning 34. is coming off a season-ending in- injury. I don't know that you want to rely on Hayward as a starter necessarily. I think having him as like your third corner or your first guy off the bench Maybe he could even play the slot. He has at times in the past at a high level. So I think you would like to push him down the depth chart one spot. And I think getting a player like Devon Witherspoon would do that right off the bat. Because Witherspoon, unlike Gonzalez, I think Witherspoon is 100% pro-ready. Much more ready to step into a starting role day one. And not really have any limitations on what he can be expected to do. Uh, Witherspoon's very polished. I love his instincts uh, as a zone defender. I mean, they're they're incredible, like some of the best I've ever seen. He's also really, really sticky in man coverage. And honestly, just the most fun thing about Witherspoon is that he's just so nasty. Uh, he's just an infectious attitude. He's a big-time chirper, all-chirp team for sure. Uh, and just a really physical player at the catch point and in run support, um, which is even more impressive given that he's not the biggest corner. You know, he's sort of average overall size, uh, what, 5'11", 5'11 and a half, I think he measured in at over 180 pounds. So not huge. Um, I think he could definitely stand to gain maybe another, you know, 5 to 10 pounds to sort of fill out that frame a little bit more. Had uh, Does have over 31-inch arms, which is pretty good. Uh, that's, again, about average in terms of length. So, I like Devon Witherspoon a lot. I do think there's an argument to be made that he is more likely to be able to come in and immediately provide high-level play versus a Christian Gonzalez, who I think still has some growing to do, but, you know, has that crazy athletic ceiling um, and all the, and all of those things. So Witherspoon is just really good, and he's really good right now. I think he's a very safe prospect. I think he is a potential cornerback one in the NFL, but the Falcons already have a cornerback one in AJ Terrell. So Devon Witherspoon's sort of size limitations and he's, he's got solid size. I mean, he's about an average sized corner. So it's not like he's small, but he doesn't have that sort of elite length uh, and size that a lot of teams look for in their top corner. But the Falcons do have a corner in AJ Terrell that sort of is able to do that. Now he does have that size. Um, you know, Terrell has struggled sometimes matching up with those bigger receivers, but on, on the whole, I think he's he's just done a very good job and has that prototypical size. Devon Witherspoon would be an elite cornerback, too, in the NFL, probably from the day he steps on the field, and I don't think that he's going to be a big drop-off uh, from A.J. Terrell if teams, if the Falcons want to play sides um, or if they want to have Terrell travel. I think, you know, they can basically mix it up and do whatever they want in terms of coverage because Witherspoon's capable of playing any coverage at a high level. He's great in zone. He's great in man. Really nasty as a run defender. Going to be really reliable as a tackler. Uh, not afraid to stick his nose in there. And his his attitude is just infectious. He's a really fun player. Um, so, yeah, he's absolutely a top 10 worthy player to me. Uh, if Christian Gonzalez is off the board, I wouldn't be surprised. If the Falcons do go for Witherspoon as as another, as another the... He's just a hair below Gonzalez because of the ceiling for me, but I I think in year one, Witherspoon's probably going to be the better player. Um, He's a lot safer in terms of his projection than a guy like Christian Gonzalez, who I think is very likely to hit at least some of his ceiling, but does have more work to do to get there as opposed to Witherspoon, who I think is pretty close to a finished product at this point, pretty ready to step in as an immediate starter, which is rare, you know, um, and why I think he's built so much hype and gotten into the top 10 in a lot of mocks is because that, that type of player doesn't always come around. Um, you know, there's usually a lot of developing you have to do and he's still got things to clean up, but, um, I I do like Witherspoon a lot. And I I think this would be a great pick for the Falcons to really get on the path to an elite secondary here in Atlanta. 
Um, moving on to the second round pick. I know everyone's been clamoring for edge help. The Falcons haven't really addressed edge in free agency. They did bring back Lorenzo Carter, who's clearly going to be a key member of the rotation. And I do think it sort of suggests that they have a lot more faith in Ebicady and D'Angelo Malone to both play bigger roles this year, you know, seeing as they haven't really added another edge guy. So I do think those guys are going to get a lot more snaps and potentially even be starters. Uh, at least Arnold Ebicady would be. Um, but I still think they need more there. They could use another high-end player there. Uh, they're not likely to get, you know, a, a, a star edge player at this point, but they can get a bunch of really good complementary pieces, a lot of really effective, talented players. And I think they can are likely to have an opportunity to do that in the second round. Uh, in this mock, I'm going with uh, edge rusher Felix Enudike Uzoma from Kansas State, who is just a really polished pass rusher at this stage, which is rare, um, especially for, for college pass rushers. He's been very consistent. Um, he had 11 sacks in 2021, probably should have had 13, but two of them were, I think he forced two fumbles like sack fumbles and the ball went past the line of scrimmage. So they actually didn't count them as sacks, which is really tragic. But, um, you know, I think it ruined his six sack, uh, potential record setting game actually. So, you know, shame on you NCAA. Uh, he had another eight and a half in 2022, 6'3", 255, so plenty of size for that position. Good, uh, good length as well. Um, he's just really advanced, I think, in how he sets up his pass rush. He's got a lot of moves. You can tell that he plans out his rush, that he has a plan. Um, and that's something that's pretty hard to find from college pass rushers, especially guys that have only been um, starting for two years, which is what he where, where he's at right now. Um I think he's a great pick at 44 as a guy who's likely to be able to be a specialized designated pass rusher this year. I don't really think he's a great run defender at this stage. He's just technically not quite there. Um, he doesn't play with great leverage against the run. I don't think he uses his hands nearly as well against the run, but I do think that he's got all of the traits to be able to do that. And I'm not concerned about him potentially growing into a full-time starting role in the future. Um, I just think he needs the coaching there. Uh, he's such an advanced pass rusher that I have no concerns about him being able to learn to, to do similar stuff as a run defender. It's just going to take a little time. Um, so throwing him into that mix with Carter, with Ebicady, with Malone, giving the Falcons just a really deep group of sort of edge two type of guys. It's not as good as having a star and a bunch of edge two guys, but it's the next best thing, right? You get a big group of guys that can all rush the passer at a high level um, maybe none of them are getting double digit sacks, but if they could all get eight, that would be a lot better than last year. So that's, that's where we're going with the second pick third round pick, pick 75, um, probably taking this in a bit of an unexpected direction for a lot of people taking a safety here at 75. I definitely was sort of honing in on a receiver given again that the Falcons, they did add Mac Hollins, who I think makes a lot of sense and is going to probably play a significant role, but not really a wide receiver two caliber guy. I think he's probably a wide receiver three in reality. And maybe that distinction doesn't really matter as much for the Falcons who are going to throw a ton of passes to the tight ends. They did bring in Jonu Smith, who maybe is going to function more like a, that sort of target. Um, but the, the value just wasn't a, as good at wide receiver here. So I went with uh, who I think was the best player on the board at this point in uh, Antonio Johnson from Texas A&M. Very unique, um, big bodied safety. He's 6'2", 198, uh, really good speed, 4.52, which is a really, really good number for a safety. Um, and he played all over the place. And I think the Falcons under Ryan Nielsen are really going to emphasize big nickel sets. Um, and this is exactly what Antonio Johnson does at a high level. He played a lot as a slot defender. He played a lot in the box, super physical, big asset and run support, very aggressive player, both in terms of attacking the ball in zone coverage and shutting down running plays. Um, he's really good in coverage against tight ends. I think he can maybe even handle some big slot receivers, not a guy you want matched up on the shifty players, but the Falcons are going to have a cornerback for when they're playing teams that are going to use that slot receiver a lot. Um, but he's just really fun, super high energy guy, athletic. Um, you know, I think his change of direction skills and his backpedal are not very good. So I think this is a guy you want playing close to the line of scrimmage, keeping stuff in front of him, but he 
he reacts really quickly. I really like how aggressive he is, uh, both in coverage and in run support. And I think he gives the Falcons a quasi starter here in the third round that can fill that big nickel role that they need. I really like his value here. This is a guy that was potentially considered even a second rounder at one point seems to have cooled off a little bit overall. Um, Due to some like good but not great athletic testing, you know, I think his jumps weren't that weren't that good, and he weighed in under 200 pounds, which I think is probably just something he did for the combine. But he hit that four five two in the 40 and that one five five ten yard split, so I don't really have any concerns about his uh, straight line athleticism. And I think this is a good value here at pick 75 to get a guy who I think is probably going to play way more snaps than people think if Ryan Nielsen is as committed to the big nickel as I sort of suspected he might be. Um, but we'll see. And I do think, you know, Johnson is just a good safety um, who can play the slot and, and do a lot of stuff for you. So I really like the, the value here at 75. Um, round four, pick 110. Going to go with one of my senior bowl darlings here, uh, linebacker Diane Henley from Washington State. Falcons really haven't addressed linebacker much. Uh, they did not bring back Rashawn Evans. They do have Troy Anderson, who I expect is going to play the lion's share of snaps, if not the entire starting role. They still have Michael Walker, who it's possible that Nielsen and company like Walker better than Dean Pease did. He sort of seemed to fall out of favor entirely with Dean Pease last year. Um, also keep in mind the Falcons have a couple of undrafted guys that they like in Nate Lambin and Dorian Etheridge, um, but they didn't really bring in a veteran starter at all at linebacker. So I think they're planning to add to this group in the draft. And as I've said a lot, you can get starting linebackers on day three in the NFL draft. Teams do it every single year. And I think Diane Henley is a great fit there. Uh, Just very, very talented coverage linebacker, former defensive back, uh, former wide receiver as well, um, who's converted to linebacker uh, over the last two years. Really athletic player, uh, hit an 8.55 RAS at the combine with a 4.54 second 40, uh, 6'1", 225. So not the biggest linebacker, obviously, a little on the smaller side there. Um, just really explosive, really smooth mover, um, and just really physical. Like the, I'm not really worried about the size. I think he hits really hard and and plays really physical. He's a very sure tackler, um, super productive at Washington state and really good in coverage. And I think that's where the Falcons could use someone right now. I think if they're going to, you know, more off ball looks, they're going to have Caden Ellis back there as that bigger linebacker they do have Troy Anderson who is also that bigger linebacker obviously he needs to get better at taking on the blocks and stuff like that but they have room for that lighter will style linebacker and I think Diane Henley could fill that role immediately he does need to continue developing his instincts and his play recognition and things like that as someone who's only played linebacker for two years um but I think this is a guy who has absolute starting upside super vocal leader at the senior bowl and in college um he just absolutely took control of the huddle in Mobile. Um, I think he will take to Atlanta's defense very quickly and, and be a good fit for them. And I uh, really like the value here early on day three as well to get a potential starter here in Henley. All right, so full disclosure, this pick was originally going to be uh, nose tackle Jared Clark from Coastal Carolina, who I am a big fan of and is a very good player. However, like immediately after I recorded this episode... We had the Falcons reinstate nose tackle Eddie Goldman, which I wouldn't necessarily bank on Goldman necessarily playing or doing a whole lot this year. But I do think it probably pushes the need for them to actually draft a nose tackle, especially like with a fourth round pick down. We also got the news a little bit after that. that they're, the Falcons are going to be visiting with uh, veteran defensive lineman Calais Campbell. Uh, so it seems like the Falcons are probably going to be making, you know, those types of moves to solidify the interior. There's not really room to draft anyone else here. Could certainly bring in guys in undrafted free agency or shuffle some players around. But uh, if they do sign Campbell and Eddie Goldman does play, that's already five guys, including Taquan Graham, David Onyemata, and Grady Jarrett that are all under contract. Not really room for anyone else. So I'm um, <clears throat> going to be adjusting this pick as a result. Instead, we're going to switch it over to the offensive trenches instead. Uh, The Falcons are going to go after their swing tackle of the future here with pick 113 in the fourth round. 
getting a dog, Georgia offensive tackle Warren McClendon in here to uh, be the swing tackle behind the recently re-signed Caleb McGarry, Jake Matthews as well. Uh, McClendon is an interesting pros- prospect. I think he's very rock solid. Um, didn't te- He didn't do any testing at the comma. He did measure in at just a hair over 6'4", 306. Um, neither one of those is particularly bad big, you know, for an offensive tackle. He did, however, come in with 34 and a half inch arms. So I don't think the length is going to be an issue for McClendon. I think he's sort of an average athlete overall. I know he didn't test, but I think his athleticism is enough to be okay in that zone blocking scheme that the Falcons are going to be running. Uh, I do think he's a pretty polished pass protector. Um, I just don't think he's really a high upside guy. I, I think he's, his ceiling is probably like a solid starter in the NFL. Maybe, you know, I, I I do think he offers guard tackle flexibility. I think he can play both left and right tackle, probably both left and right guard. So I think that makes him a perfect day three offensive line addition that can be a young swing tackle for the Falcons can fill that dog quota, right? Get that, get that bulldog in here that I know everyone's clamoring for. Um, I think he's really smart. I think he's polished pass protector. I think he plays hard. Uh, I don't have any questions about his effort level or his, his physicality or his toughness. Um, I don't really think he's a high end athlete. I don't think he's exceptionally strong either, but I do think he checks the boxes to such an extent that he can be a solid starter for you. Perfect swing tackle, perfect sort of sixth offensive lineman on your roster that can play, you know, on the interior or outside. Um, I believe he's played pretty much entirely at tackle, but I don't know that for sure. So he may need to be cross-trained at guard if they do want him to have that flexibility to play there. But I think as a rookie, he could come in, be your swing tackle, a guy that you bring along. Maybe he does play better uh, than expected, can potentially be a starter for you. But I think if he's just a high-end swing tackle and and good reserve at this price of a, of a you know, mid fourth round pick. I think that's a good value. I do like McClendon. I I think he's a pretty safe selection here if he does make it this far. Um, So gives the Falcons an opportunity to address swing tackle with a young quality player, not have to spend a lot of money on that spot uh, going forward. And I I think that we'll be pretty happy with McClendon in that spot, um, even though he doesn't necessarily provide like high upside, but uh, a good player, rock solid player. I think fans will be very happy with uh, in Atlanta. Uh, moving on to round five, pick 155 from the Jaguars. This is the Calvin Ridley trade pick. Excuse me, I think it's pick 159, not 155. Excuse me. Didn't get the wide receiver early. I think the Falcons are going to be trying to do that as much as they can. But if they do miss, I don't think they're going to reach on somebody. There is a, a sort of cluster of these really good athlete receivers who have some work to do to be you know NFL ready. I think... Yosevis is probably the, the my favorite uh, and, and the one that's likely to go early, potentially earlier than this. But the other guys, you know, like Bryce Ford Wheaton and Matt Landers, um, you know, there's a cluster of these guys. And I think one of them will probably still be available here uh, in the middle of the fifth round. But, the you know, early on, the receivers went off quite early, um, like much more than I expected heading into the third round. That may have a sort of bounce effect of then, there being a little bit of a gap and when these guys go. And I think if Yosevis is still there in the fifth round, you definitely pounce on him. Um, just a great size speed weapon. Uh, finished with a 9.92 RAS. Really impressive. Uh, over 6'3", 205. Hit a 4.43 in the 40, which is absolutely crazy. Um, jumped really well. Had some great agility testing as well. Uh, he's a size speed guy. Uh, I, I do think... He checks all the size boxes. He checks all the athleticism boxes. Um, He runs a very limited route tree at this point. I I do think he's good at the routes that he does run. So I I think there's definitely potential for him to learn more routes, but he's going to be limited as a rookie. Um, His hands can be kind of inconsistent, but he's also made some really great catches. So I think that's another thing that you could probably continue to work on. Um, The nice thing about, Yosevis is that while I think he's a role player early on, probably a deep ball specialist, um, I think he's got the potential to turn into a wide receiver too. Like he has all the traits to eventually get there. It might take two to three years before he hits that ceiling, but this is a fifth round pick. 
for a guy who I think can provide you some immediate value as a deep ball specialist. Um, so I, I do like this this fit for the Falcons a lot here uh, in the fifth round. If he's still around, if not, you know, you could replace this pick with like Bryce Ford Wheaton or Matt Landers, other guys that are those size speed weapons and similarly need a lot of work, but uh, can probably provide you at least some some deep ball stuff as, as rookies. And of course, being great athletes are probably going to be an asset on special teams as well. Um, all right, final pick because the Falcons have now traded uh, their, their other seventh round picks away at this point. So their only seventh rounder now is round seven, pick 224. Um, and I'm going to use this one to get uh, one of my favorite sort of sleeper running backs who really, really impressed at the combine. Um, definitely got on my radar and probably got on the radar of a lot of other evaluators as well with his performance. And that's a uh, Daenerys Prince. Uh, from Tulsa, um, who really like lit up the combat. I mean, this guy had a nine eight seven, finished as the most athletic running back, just a hair ahead of Bijan Robinson. Technically, um, hit a four four one in the forty, which is really fast for a running back. Uh, jumped over ten feet in the broad. Um, and came in with some pretty good size too, nearly six foot two sixteen. Um. This is a guy that actually does look like an Arthur Smith running back, right? He's bigger. He's got that weight. Um, not just a, a scat back or a change of pace guy. Actually plays with quite a bit of power in his when in his style. I won't claim that I've watched like a ton of his film, but I, I did watch, you know, a few plays here and there. Um, but yeah, I think he's got some good power, got some good contact balance, has that long speed to be a home run threat. Um he just needs to work on a lot of the details of the position. Like I think his vision is pretty hit or miss. I think his footwork is sloppy. There's a lot of wasted movement. He doesn't really gear down very well. Um, and I think his ability in the passing game is kind of a big question mark. I don't really see any reason that he couldn't develop there. I think he's, he's made some good catches, just not a lot of them. Um, but his pass blocking is definitely a work in progress. So um, this is a guy that is, is probably not going to challenge for like a, heavy role as a rookie, but this is someone I think you can develop. Um, and I, I would definitely spend the seventh round pick to make sure that you get him in Atlanta's training camp and he doesn't go elsewhere as an undrafted free agent because that athletic ceiling is really, really impressive. Um, and I think he's got the traits and the build to fit in this offense immediately. Um, we've seen the Falcons turn these later round guys, these undrafted free agents into big time contributors. And I think that they, this could be the next one to go after. Um, so I think for the price of just 224, this is the guy I would definitely swing at and, and see if we can get uh, a good complimentary running back here uh, without having to expend significant resources. So if we don't get Bijan, why not get, you know, the next uh, most athletic guy in the class, right? Because uh, that that's definitely going to provide the same results, de right? Definitely. Um, no, but uh, I do like Prince. I, I think he would be an interesting fit here uh, and not a lot of cost associated with that either. So. Yeah, guys, that's our, uh, I guess, our inaugural mock draft here on the Dirty Birds and Brews podcast. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I will keep you guys updated if there are any more changes, but the feed and everything should be fully settled now that you're seeing this episode. If you have any issues, definitely hit me up, falcoholiclive at gmail.com. If you're interested in advertising on the show, also hit me up there. Join our community Discord. Link is right there in the show description. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you're interested in supporting the show on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash falcoholiclive. Uh, lots of, of cool things there, like our exclusive Q and a sessions, uh, a special channel on the discord where you get to chat with myself and other Falcoholic, uh, staff members, as well as uh, exclusive early ad free access to all the podcast episodes as well. So definitely check that out guys. Uh, yeah. If you're watching on YouTube, like subscribe. If you're listening on the podcast platforms, please do leave us that five-star review. Those will help the feed continue to grow. And, uh, and yeah, share, share the good news that the, uh, Dirty Birds and Brews podcast is out there, uh, for all your buddies who are Falcons fans or just fans of, you know, good old fashioned football talk. So again, guys, thanks so much for listening. I'm Kevin. I have Falcon. Kevin. We'll see you next time on the Dirty Birds and Brews podcast. Until then guys, have a great day.